Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. Hey, welcome, Noelle. I really appreciate your being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) No problem. And thank you for all of your uh, uh, hard work in getting here today. (laughs) I appreciate it. It was more adventurous than I thought it would be. I'm (laughs) glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad that it worked out. So that is really good. Um, yeah, so we've been waiting a while to do this, and I'm yes. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I I definitely want to ask you first off, though, if you have an early memory of sound and how it moved you. Do you have anything from your childhood that got you started on this journey? Yes, yes. So I was one of those kids that would often write music, um, not necessarily you know on pen and paper all the time, but just was always singing a song of some sort and making up making up things in my imagination. Um, But when I started to be able to write, I started crafting a song and I thought it was great. And I I distinctly remember I was laying down on the floor halfway between my bedroom and the hallway and my older siblings came by and they were like, oh, what are you doing? Came and looked at my song. And the reason I remember it is because how much they made fun of me because I couldn't quite spell yet. <laughs> oh, that's and so, so cute, though. <laughs> instead of fearless tiger, I spelled furless tiger rubber. And I just, I've never forgotten that. I don't know exactly how old I was, but I couldn't spell well. So <laughs> <laughs> that's so adorable. One of my though. first songs. <laughs> so, but what did that instill in you? Like, did it. Did it stop you from being fearless? I mean, no, no. So I kept writing, thankfully. Thankfully, yeah, that didn't because, yeah, it could add, I suppose, you know, like, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to fail. But music just was a natural way for me to express myself. Um, I didn't always have a very easy time identifying my emotions or being able to express my emotions. I was very shy. Mm -hmm. So music just was how I would express myself. And I I recall just always writing music through through the years. It just was a natural part of of me. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember uh being bullied as a child. Mm-hmm. So like my my writing had a lot to do with getting through that. Yeah. Which I'm sure you get that all the time from your <laughs> your practice and you know, people telling you how they got through trauma oh, yeah. by writing and and getting it out there absolutely anything that that separates it from you and puts it out of side side of your body that can Mm -hmm. be very healing yeah definitely so is that what got you interested in music therapy i mean what was the transition to get there because i know you it's probably a long and winding road but yeah (laughs) i'll try to shorten it a little okay (laughs) Um, so I, i had always done music as you know as i said and when it came time to decide what to do for college, um, I was I was apprehensive about studying music because that just felt like a big risk. And I asked my dad, what should I what should I do? And he was like, music, like, that's what you've done your whole life. You've been performing since you were 10. And I would, was always in musicals and just loved music. Uh, it was just, you know, I was a choir geek and all that and state choirs and stuff. So that was just, music was part of my identity. So um, naturally, I studied music ed and um, found pretty quickly after my observations that I did not like music ed. And I just, I didn't want to be in that classroom setting like that with, you know, 20, 30, 40 kids. And it's like, no, this is not, this is not for me. Um, So I Googled careers in music and that was the first time I found music therapy, my freshman year of college. Um, And I ended up transferring. I I had one more year left 
uh, in that college where I was. And then I transferred into a, my junior year in to study music therapy. Wow. So what goes into studying music therapy? Like, what do you study? Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. So you actually have to have an approved music therapy program um, approved by the American Music Therapy Association. You can't just like make up a degree and say, oh, I'm going to do, which a lot of people think they can just do it, like study music and psychology. I meet yeah. many, many students who are like, I want to do music therapy. I'm studying music and psychology. I'm like, that's great. But <laughs> if there's you, more to it than yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to actually be a board certified music therapist, then you have to do an approved program. Um, and then there's 1,200 clinical hours. So that's face to face with clients under supervision. And then if you pass all that, get through all your coursework, um, with your coursework, you are a music major. So you have all that. But then on top of that, you have your more psychology classes, you have your music therapy specific classes. Um, maybe some anatomy, things like that. So um, after you do all that, you can sit for your board certification test. And if you pass that, then you get your MTBC, which is music therapist board certified. Okay. So was there something in that study that surprised you that you needed to learn? Oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Both uh, academically and personally. It really, I think any helping profession, um, if you don't grow, then you you can't help other people grow, you know. And so we see a lot of a lot of people who start in music therapy studying, they don't make it to the end. There's just oh. so many people that drop out in between because they have this idea of what music therapy is, but then when they actually actually have to do the personal work, then if they don't want to do that, then they end up doing something else. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's a matter of being vulnerable yourself mm -hmm. in order Absolutely. to understand where your clients would be coming from. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's really fascinating. And I know that you took this work to Africa and India as well, right? So uh, yeah. what was involved there? Yeah. So in Africa is when I was still a student. Mm -hmm. um, and so it looked a little more like music education, I'd say. But um, but I did. I was like a kind of a camp counselor for girls, uh, preteen girls, fun times. And <laughs> it was, uh, I was the only cabin that it was just me. Every other cabin had two counselors. Mine was just me. And I had all these preteen girls and they were, you know, how they just fight and stuff. So we had lots of great discussions of getting along, communication. But aside from that, I taught flute and, um, and choir as well. So we used the music as a way to um, to just connect. And then we also went around and, and played at some different churches um, in, there in Africa. And then in India, that was just a few years ago. Um, that was a little more intense medically, where we went to a hospital for, um, it's a pediatric hospital for kids with developmental disabilities. And then we also were at a, um, uh, not an orphanage, but a, a home for like a, a, yeah, kind of a home for kids with developmental disabilities, because in India, it's still very much um, in many parts of India. If you have a disability, you are ostracized. And so the place that we were working, they saw children for children, not that they're cursed or, you know, ha ha that way for some specific reason, other than something happened in development in utero and they ended up with this disability. So we were able to do, we did, did a three-day conference, myself, um, physical therapist, occupational therapist, audiologist, speech therapist. And we shared with doctors that came from around um, around the, the state. We were in Kerala, India, um, but some came from all around and came and saw us. Um, we spoke of how, well, I spoke of how music works with developmental disabilities and neurologically. Um, and then we were able to work, you know, hands on with the kids and co treat with the therapists there and the doctors. And it was, it was a really great experience. Mm, yeah, it sounds like it would have been really wonderful. So, if music therapy is used in these kinds of situations, how does it actually change things neurologically? Mm -hmm. I mean, you must have seen that actually happen real time while you were 
there and and I'm sure you see it real time all the time now too. <laughs> yeah, so it 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 depends on the goals and who we're working with. Um, you know, we work with a lot of different people across uh different diagnoses. So, you know, for someone with traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, um, a stroke, it's going to look different than someone with a developmental disability, like maybe autism or Down syndrome. Um, and that's going to look different than an individual that's uh, maybe a teenager that's working on uh, emotional regulation or emotional expression because they're really struggling with anxiety or depression. So neurologically, um, kind of the same thread is in there, though, of uh, when mu- when we make music, Or even when we listen to music, it activates many parts of the brain. And so speech generally activates kind of one area. But when we uh, when we sing, when we uh, play musical instruments, it activates many different parts of the brain. So the music's timbre, rhythm, melody, the words, the lyrics, um, all those different parts of music they all activate different parts of the brain. And so it's like a, it's one of the few things in the world that activates so many, it ex- exercises the whole brain. Um, and that's why it can get our attention very easily uh, rather than just just speaking alone. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Is there like a different tone or timbre? You said that they, they work differently for different neurological problems or, or issues. Um, so, so out of curiosity, like what exactly is that? So if, uh, if you were working with someone with autism, for instance, or you are working with someone like a teen who can't regulate their emotions as efficiently or, or well as maybe they, they could. Uh, so like what would be the different music that you might prescribe, I guess? <laughs> Yeah, so it's very much client preferred music. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's going to be case by case, depends on the person we're working with, uh, even how they're doing that day. So if, say, if it was someone with autism and they, um, you know, were hypo aroused, which just means they were like hyperactive and not in that homeostasis, they were woo, way up here and dysregulated, um, we might initially start a little bit up more up uh as far as the the beats per minute um start closer to where they are and then gradually lower that beats per minute um and that's known as the iso principle so Um, we're sympathetic to the music we're hearing yes oh yes and our interesting even there's been some really cool studies that show um how our heart regulates to the rhythm and um in like if if music therapists are working in the ICU or in the NICU, um, so intensive care unit or with neonatal intensive care unit, so babies, um, their breathing, their breath rate slows to the music as well. And so we can use these, you know, physiological changes to actually affect the, um, our nervous system to help to regulate it. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And I, I'm curious as to if you can talk about a particular case study or any case studies. I mean, you know, obviously without names or anything, you know, but uh, it, are there any particular clients that you've worked with that have been really helped by this? Currently, we have a grant that's serving people with traumatic brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. And so because of that, we've been getting a lot of feedback to, you know, pass along to the board and things like that. So we've gotten some really, um, not surprising, I guess, because, you know, we know music therapy works, but some really touching uh, feedback. I, That's I think. always nice. And it's good to know that you're making a difference. You yes. Know? Yes. Because yeah. it's, it's not the easiest job always. Mm-hmm. And so it's so important to, to know that what we do is helping people, you know, and supporting them. So I um, had a... Uh, a client in the practice that um, they, well, what they said is, um, I'm a disabled, I am disabled because of mental health and PTSD symptoms and music therapy is helping me work through many issues very directly in a way that years of talk therapy hasn't been able to touch. Um, for this individual, they had been through year, yeah, years of, of talk therapy. And for some people that is very valuable and very helpful, you know, myself included. Um, But like myself 
I had to start with music therapy first because it just accesses the brain in a different way. It accesses the body in a different way than just talking. We're able to express ourselves in a nonverbal way um, and not have to always tap into that, the logical parts of our brain, but it can keep us in, in the emotional aspects of our brain, which a lot of times, you know, for individuals that have PTSD, that's, that's a scary place to go. Yeah. Um, that if we get there in the wrong context, it can be triggering. So when we have the music, the music is like, it's like a container mm-hmm. you know, and it helps us feel safe. We know there's a beginning, middle and an end. So that keeps our brain from, from like being like, I don't know what to expect. Um, and then also music structure, you know, it, again, it has that rhythm. It has a predictable melody almost always, unless you're listening to 20th century music or something weird like that, <laughs> but <laughs> usually it's predictable. Um, mm-hmm. Our brains know what to expect and that's comforting. And so be- oh, yeah. because of that, um, you can work through these challenges like PTSD and anxiety, depression. Um, another individual, they shared that this was like a, a safe space. Um, she said it was one of the only safe spaces where she felt like she could be vulnerable um, and actually felt heard. And that's another really cool part of the music too, is mm-hmm. even for our, our individuals who are non-speaking, you know, that's what I worked with many kids who had multiple disabilities who couldn't speak. That was not their like mode of communication. Um, but the music improvising, usually on the piano or the xylophone, um, that was a way that they could express themselves, whatever they wanted to, but at the same time they could be heard and I could communicate back to them, maybe on the xylophone or the piano. And it was a musical conversation where they could feel like they belonged. They could feel heard and listened to maybe for the first time to truly be in a place where, you know, they could express themselves. Um, so that, in addition to that, I think it, it's a way that we can form relationships through that sure. nonverbal communication too, which yeah. we know that through research, that research, um, uh, that relationship, that therapeutic relationship is actually the most important piece to healing. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.